Scusa, ma io su YouTube non vedo uh, niente. Giusto? Ser. 15 secondi. Ok. Magari... Ok. Adesso sto vedendo. Ecco, adesso mi vedo. Ok. Uh. Io ci sono, io ci sono. Eh, se potete togliere qualche speaker. Va bene. Se potete chiudere, c'è un ritorno, c'è un ritorno in cuffia. Ok. Siamo pronti? Ok. Scusate, ma io ho ancora un ritorno in cuffia. Uh, Stefano o um, Elisabetta, mi dite che tutto a posto l'audio su YouTube? Elisabetta? A posto. Sì, sono tutti. Okay. Sono... Siamo a posto, sì? Sì. Sì, sono tutti muti, tranne lei. Scusate, non riesco a parlare che c'è un ritorno in cuffia. Io sento l'audio di YouTube che arriva. Ok. Scusate, come audio va bene così? O... Perché non, sì, io non ho il microfono, cioè c'è quello dell'iPad, ma si sente bene? Sì. Grazie. All right, let's start then. Welcome to... Okay. Let's start, guys. Welcome to this webinar on artificial intelligence. Elisabetta, mi puoi, o oh, Stefano, mi potete chiamare perché c'è un ritorno in cuffia? Hai l'audio di YouTube acceso, penso. Dovresti azzerare l'audio di YouTube. Sì, okay. Bisogna probabilmente chiudere tutti i YouTube sì, 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 e, okay, usare okay, solo, okay. e usare solo Zoom. Ok, ho capito, ho capito. Ok, ho capito qual è il problema. Va bene, ok, we can now start. Okay, uh, welcome to this webinar on artificial intelligence systems. Uh, this occasion uh, is the launch of a newly designed two-year graduate master in artificial intelligence systems. Uh, the master is offered by the Department of Computer Science and Information Engineering at the University of Trento. For this event, we wanted to have first-hand stories from researchers, engineers, entrepreneurs that will tell us what is AI doing for them and their services and products, uh, what their AI teams are doing. And you students that uh, you're listening on YouTube might be doing when you graduate from the Master in Artificial Intelligence Systems. In this presentation, you will hear about AI systems and technologies across different industry sectors from finance to medicine. 
Now on the interaction sites and logistics, we are in this room here uh, doing the video call with the other uh, panel members, but you're watching on YouTube and there we're uh, reading, sitting through questions or comments you might have that we're collecting. And by the end of this event, we'll have a Q&A session and select some that we can answer now and some that we'll be able to answer in our website or next week uh, event. In fact, next week, uh, you may know we have another event where we present all of the uh, uh, masters in um, the offer the computer science and information engineer department also in collaboration with other departments where you'll have more in-depth uh, discussion and presentation. I am Giuseppe Riccardi and I'm the Dean of Undergrad and Grad Studies and with me helping me uh, with this event, there's also Professor Palopoli, who's the uh, director of the Master in Artificial Intelligence Systems. And now to officially start this event, I would like to invite, and I'm honored to have the rector of the University of Trento, Professor Paolo Collini. Please, uh, Paolo. Thank you, Giuseppe, and my warm welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time in this very peculiar time, which we are all living uh, to, to participate in this event. And my welcome particularly goes to yeah. the student. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, goes particularly to the prospective student, to the people that are thinking about uh, being the first pioneers that will be part of this program for the, for the, for the first year. Uh, anytime we, we have a new program, uh, in a university, there is a sort of excitement because we, we in our strategic plan, we put very clear uh, that uh, we, we go for new programs when programs combine uh, three characteristics. Uh, the first one is to take the best of the knowledge we have available in our university. Uh, we are a research university and uh, uh, we usually are, uh, ranked very well uh, in the research we do in the Department of Informatics and, and um, Information Technology is one of the best departments we have in the university, got the recognition of being part of the excellence program of the country in Italy. And of course, the knowledge we are put, making available is uh, on the top of the world. So that's part of our strategy. We don't do things where we are not confident when we are able to do at the best at the highest level in the world. The second thing, we always try to combine uh, knowledge from different areas. Of course, there is a department that is uh, the master of the program, in that sense, for so the, the champion of the program, uh, taking care of, the, of designing the program, but there's always a big effort in bringing together our areas of knowledge in the university. A university is a place where knowledge is covering all different areas, and we are lucky because we are doing we do extremely well in most of the areas, probably all the areas where we are involved. And so we always try to get not just a specialized vertical, uh, uh, deep understanding of issues and uh, knowledge in a specific area, but all, always try to combine with different areas of knowledge. The third thing, we always try to focus programs on the next step of innovation in the society, in the world, in the industry. So what's going to be uh, on the top of the list, uh, not now, but 10 years from now. Uh, so this program is matching perfectly all the requirements. So I'm quite happy and uh, I'm very confident that the, the work's been done to, to design the program, uh, to, to put together the resources, the best resources we have in the university for this program. We deliver an excellent curriculum to the student, an excellent opportunity. And of course, this is one of the issues uh, issue where we know for sure that uh, in the next decade, and even longer than that, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the business area, in the, work, in the work market, there will be a very high demand for knowledgeable people capable of dealing with this issue, capable of taking uh, the knowledge they have to the next step. So, I'm very happy that there is such a high attention to this program. Uh, I would say that uh, even in this very strange and uh, unhappy time in which we are uh, in these weeks, for the next few weeks still, 
Uh, the department has shown how the information technology and how the artificial intelligence particularly is able to, to help the society to face different issues. Uh, very recently, uh, the department has been on the top of the news for a development of uh, um, a device that was able to detect at a very early stage in a very unusual, in a very unusual system, uh, the disease that is affecting or potentially affecting or is caused by the, the virus. Uh, so that's the way we do it. You know, uh, technology is available and is, is made available to solve problems and solve problems that are really crucial in our time. Uh, I understand that everybody is wondering probably how the university will be uh, in the next few months. And if you're thinking about applying for this program, uh, I'm sure that this question is part of the question that you have in your mind. Uh, well, my suggestion is very simple, uh, and I would say very natural. Uh, uh, my, my answer is, well, if, when you have to make a decision for your, the future of your life, uh, think about how long is the future. Uh, the, the future lasts for all your life. So the decision you will make uh, in the next few weeks, where you're going to be, uh, and the next year and the year after that, will affect your life forever. Um, you know that because all of, all of you are a university student, most of you are already graduate or are about to graduate very soon. And uh, you know very well how important is the university where you go for your, for your studies. Uh, it means the kind of, of learning environment you are in, the kind of uh, people you get to know, uh, who are the people that will be in touch during the program, but people that will you meet at the university will be part of your life for your lifetime. And you know that the learning experience is what really counts. We, we invest a lot in, uh, in the learning experience of the students, and we know very well that uh, in the, for the first semester of next year, it will be very difficult to provide the kind of high quality education uh, hands-on education that we like to provide. And the, the, the program has been designed very much in that way. But don't be afraid. Uh, we'll be back uh, very soon uh, with our regular way of doing things, taking advantage of all the technologies that are available. Uh, distance learning may be good. And uh, I would say that is already part, was already part of the way uh, the Department of Information Technology and uh, Computer Engineering has been doing things in the last decade. So nothing's new. Uh, we'll do it intensively for the first semester because that's a requirement. We are required to provide distance education in the first semester. But a few weeks later, we'll be back to business and uh, it will be a great pleasure to have all the students around back in Trento and in the university and to be able to, pro to, to give them the kind of learning experience that we think is crucial and essential to education. Uh, at the level we want to take the education. So I'm happy that you had the chance to be here. Uh, you have a very, very knowledgeable panel uh, here that can provide you the, the, the feeling of what we are talking about, what the program is going to deal with. It's a very small part. Uh, people that are around the table virtually are really coming from all around the world. Uh, uh, are really the best people that can give you the understanding of uh, what is on the state uh, in this program. So thank you very much for the time of being here. I enjoyed the, the panel and uh, good luck with your future. Whatever you want to do, uh, make a good choice, think about the future and uh, do something that you like. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Rector. Thank you for being here. And now I pass the floor for a welcome uh, to the department chair, Professor Paolo Giorgini. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks to Giuseppe. And let me thank uh, Paolo Collini, director of the university for his words. And uh, uh, in particular also the, the presence of director in, the, in this opening. Actually, this uh, testify also the relevance for the university of this new, uh, new program. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the program is built uh, not only on the competence and experience of members of our department, but also on the experience of uh, colleagues of other departments. This is uh, actually a, a really multidisciplinary 
interdisciplinary program in which uh, we, we, we strongly believe. Um, as uh, Giuseppe said, this is uh, actually today, it's uh, really an exciting, important moment uh, for, for uh, the department, for all of us. Uh, we officially uh, present uh, uh, the new program, something to which uh, we worked very hard in the last year. And uh, we are really proud uh, to, to propose a very competitive and uh, challenging program. All members of our department are involved in, the, in this program with their competence and experience that actually they acquired in, in more than 20 years uh, working uh, in research, but also in, in, in projects, especially in industrial projects. And we are really uh, ready uh, to, to, to give all this experience uh, to you within the program. Uh, the department also invested in this new program with the new research laboratories, uh, which uh, that will be ready in September when uh, we will uh, start the new academic year. And uh, this will be available to all of the students that uh, are uh, um, attending uh, our courses. I don't want to uh, spend too more time. I want to uh, uh, just leave uh, uh, now the, word, the, the, the floor to, uh, to Luigi and, and Giuseppe for presenting the program. Let me thank again the rector, uh, Giuseppe and Luigi and all the other people uh, behind the scene that worked very hard to organizing this event. Thanks to all the speakers that uh, we have uh, uh, today here. And thanks all of you uh, to be here. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> Paolo. Um, okay, so now we uh, get right into the heart of the program. Uh, so I invite you to the stage, <laughs> Professor Luigi Palopoli, uh, who's the uh, director of the master program. Let me remind you, this is a two year graduate master in artificial intelligence system. And he will spend um, 15 minutes describing the motivation uh, for this master, um, uh, how we came up with the ideas that we put into this and the, some novel uh, innovation also in the way we design uh, the, the curriculum. Uh, we will actually have an in-depth comparative evaluation of the masters next week. So here we present the idea and the high level the structure of the course. There is a pointer also in the website to the, the syllabi. And uh, whoever wants to get a more in-depth comparative <coughs> and Q&A, we're going to have a new session uh, next week. So without further ado, <coughs> I'll leave the floor to Professor Luigi Palopoli. Okay, thank you very much. I will uh, now give you uh, an overview of uh, uh, our, our master. And, uh, and most importantly, as Giuseppe said, uh, uh, trying to point out the motivations that led us to designing this brand new initiative. Okay, let's uh, start uh, uh, by saying that uh, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, is not uh, at all a new word. It's been around uh, for quite some time. Uh, it was invented in, in the 1950s by Turing himself, who is the creator of all computer science as we know it uh, today. Uh, then there was a period of time between the 60s and the 70s in which uh, um, the, this first uh, moment of enthusiasm uh, faded away and uh, uh, AI became uh, merely the star of novels and uh, uh, um, science fiction movies. Uh, in the 80s, at the beginning of the 80s, roughly, uh, something new took place because uh, uh, in the many universities, uh, uh, new math was invented that uh, allowed uh, us to be uh, more effective in developing algorithms for artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, this raised a lot of expectations, especially in medicine. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, the level of technology uh, could not match the level of these expectations and uh, very, uh, let's say that the, the technology was not up to the task. And after a while, uh, the hype, second hype subsided again. Uh, now we come uh, to the uh, early uh, years of, of, uh, of the new century where uh, something new took place. First of all, there was uh, some uh, relevant breakthroughs in AI technologies. All of us know that 
uh, AI system has started to rival with humans in such fields as chess games or uh, Geopardy. Uh, and and, and on, on the meantime, uh, what happened was that uh, Apple invented the iPhone and uh, uh, an entire world of uh, uh, new application that now we know as Web 2.0, I mean Facebook, I mean uh, YouTube and all this stuff, um, started to take up, and, and the take up was tremendously uh, quick, and uh, and a lot of AI technologies uh, were behind uh, this this development. Now we are in 2020, and the question is, what is the future? Are we ready for a new uh, quantum leap, or uh, what do we have to do? Okay, okay. With such a long story of. Uh, um, uh, behind, it's no surprise that uh, artificial intelligence was deeply intertwined uh, with uh, uh, other fields of computer sciences, and thereby many universities in Italy and also in Europe, also in the best places in the world, uh, have proposed over the past, uh, past few years uh, um, master courses in uh, AI, or at least master courses that had some kind of uh, AI uh, flowers. Uh, these courses uh, were rooted in the tradition of AI uh, and uh, uh, covered, the, uh, covered and cover today uh, very well uh, uh, the traditional aspects that uh, uh, have been uh, uh, the foundation of AI, uh, such as uh, reasoning, uh, knowledge, uh, logic, but also uh, perception and control, speech, language, vision. And, uh, uh, and then uh, the methodologies that are the backbone of these applications like uh, machine learning uh, and optimization. Uh, but the, the AI as we know it today cannot be limited to these things, however important uh, they are. There are new areas like robotics, also like uh, dialogue and interaction systems that uh, are part of the game and are only partially covered uh, uh, by traditional courses for the very reason that when these things came out uh, or at least uh, again at momentum, uh, uh, the, the, the traditional courses already existed and had the legacy to carry on. And uh, importantly, there, are, there is now a new world of things that pertain uh, to the uh, uh, human and computer interactions such affect and social skin, uh, behavior and ethics, and also innovation based on, on AI that are uh, really hardly covered by this traditional uh, uh, CV. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the reason why these things are important is that they are uh, at the basis, they underpin a new generation of extremely important AI systems that have broken the wall of the academy and are now available for everybody of us to use. Each of us knows what smartphones and personal device systems are. It's a common experience nowadays to be able to talk to, a, to, to, your, to your mobile phone just in the same way as you would do with another human. Uh, you would do the same with Alexa. You can uh, ask also for your favorite music. Uh, and, uh, and the system is able to tune its performance to the knowledge that it starts to develop around uh, the person that it assists. We, uh, the director has been very effective in mentioning some recent uh, breakthroughs in medicine um, due, uh, enabled by the availability of AI technologies. Today, we, have, we are so lucky to have Professor Zenati who will give us more uh, uh, vision on, on this, uh, visibility on, this, on these issues. And then there is the uh, revolution of autonomous driving. Uh, which is a technology that uh, is, is in, a, in a very quick uh, development. Uh, in, a, in a very few years, uh, the driving experience will be like no one seen uh, has uh, ever seen uh, before. And then there is the world of robotics. Robots are no longer those big cumbersome uh, um, entities, machines that they had to be segregated away from the workers, but work hand in hand with uh, workers have to adapt to their, uh, to their needs and also have to develop sort of smooth interaction that, uh, that, that, that take advantage of uh, what uh, humans uh, can do. And there is a, a whole lot of new application of uh, uh, robots uh, that have to do with uh, social uh, society like assisting uh, children or, or elderly. Okay, all of these systems are really a reality, are no longer stuff for science fiction, 
it's something that generates business. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, it, over just a few years, the, 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 the overall spending in this area will reach uh, 3.9 uh, trillion euros and it will create uh, millions and millions of jobs. Much more jobs will be created than will be uh, displaced uh, by, by, by the, the, the artificial intelligence, okay? And most importantly, these type of jobs will be good jobs, jobs that are uh, well paid. Here I just reported what is the average wage of, for, uh, of, of this type of, uh, of jobs in the United States to give you an idea of the, the order of magnitude of how much is important to have this type of professionals. Okay, in order to uh, support the creation and development of this type of systems, we have decided as a department that we needed a completely new approach, okay? Uh, we couldn't simply concentrate on the classical things that have been uh, around uh, uh, related to artificial intelligence, but we had to cover the wider spectrum of competencies. And we were in condition to do this because we are building this course from the grounds up. We had no legacy to carry on. We could uh, just uh, start uh, developing our, our own course, thinking of the future and of the needs of AI systems. So, uh, we, we, we wonder what does uh, AI professional needs? He needs to understand, he or she needs to understand what intelligence is, so brain and neurosciences. He, need, he or she needs to be knowledgeable with how to make this intelligent uh, way of uh, operating into algorithms that can run in computers, how to engineer systems out of them and how to understand uh, uh, the ethical implication uh, and also the possible legal liabilities of using uh, this type of robot. We needed to cover the entire spectrum of these competences and we were in condition to do it because we uh, had, uh, we could borrow competences from a large uh, set of uh, um, researchers and, uh, uh, and very expert engineers across several departments. Clearly the cornerstone of our construction is the Department of Engineering and Computer Science to which both Professor Riccardi and myself belong. But uh, we had also uh, we sought, in, uh, we have also sought important competencies in the Department of Industrial Engineering where they have a very renowned uh, standing in uh, such areas as autonomous driving and robotics. Uh, in the Center for uh, Mind and Brain Sciences in Rovereto. Uh, which we needed for their uh, neuroscience uh, uh, competence and in the faculty of law, because as, as I needed, we, uh, as I said, we needed also uh, to, to, to convey a message on what are the legal and judicial implication of developing uh, an uh, AI uh, based uh, system. Uh, so we are lucky enough to have in our team competences in all this, from all these departments. So it's a truly multi-departmental effort designed with the need of um, modern AI system in mind. So how is the course uh, structured? As Professor Riccardi said, I here give you only a quick overview for the simple reason that there will be uh, another event in one week from now in which we will go much more in depth. So there, there is a, a basis of a, uh, 48 credits in mandatory courses, which give you the fundamental um, information regarding artificial intelligence. Then for uh, then we've got uh, 12 uh, uh, credits in the in-depth uh, area in which we go deep down in such areas as planning, robotics, optimization, etc., which are fundamental to further take the last uh, uh, step, which is into the specialization. We offer five uh, uh, specializations in intelligent robots, uh, computer vision, system methodologies, AI and innovation. Then we have uh, free choice courses uh, and, and, uh, and the stage and the uh, final thesis. Alongside, there is another possibility, which is to study artificial intelligence from the perspective of uh, uh, neurosciences. So in this case, after the mandatory courses, uh, much of the work is done in Rovereto in cooperation with our friend in the CMEC uh, department, which is, which is a, a leading institution in the area of uh, uh, brain and neurological uh, uh, sciences. Okay, so I gave you now a very quick overview. As I said, and Professor Riccardi said as well, uh, there will be uh, an event explicitly devoted on describing in depth the different uh, 
um, the different courses and also the relation between the different masters in our didactical uh, offer. Uh, there is a website which is up and then you can uh, you can consult and get uh, a lot of information regarding uh, our courses. And then there is us, clearly you can uh, feel free to contact us whenever you want for uh, any question. As a last uh, thing, let me just uh, say that uh, it's possible to apply right now. Uh, the, the, the applications are open. So there are 80 positions available. So you can, uh, uh, at, at, the, at the moment, only the call for EU citizen is, uh, is open. You can just uh, connect uh, to the website and check in your application. That's pretty much all, Giuseppe. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Luigi. So um, I think now we are ready to get into the uh, other part of this uh, event, which is actually having a uh, fireside chat, as some would say, we don't have a fireside, but uh, we'll try to be as cozy as possible. So we'll start and enjoy this chat with these illustrious uh, speakers. And um, we'll, I will do some Q&A with them and Luigi as well. And then again, please write if you have any compelling questions for them in the chat and we'll dig them uh, through. So I would like to call on the stage uh, Fabio Casati. And uh, I'm pleased to start uh, introducing him because first of all, he's a colleague from the University of Trento. And so also gets the title of Professor Fabio Casati, but actually is now on leave in uh, uh, Palo Alto, um, California at ServiceNow. And so what I would like to start with him is just tell us about, you know, your background, what do you do, your company, I'm very curious, and the sector you work, uh, the, the, the type of AI that you put or you would like to put in your services and products. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. It's a big pleasure to be here and to be, uh, say, at least virtually uh, back in Trento. Um, so in service now, I actually work in the uh, machine learning part of the platform. So what, what basically we do is uh, we build uh, machine learning solutions that we uh, actually uh, put as part of the service now platform. So service now is basically a digital uh, business process platform. So basically what we do is uh, we help customers to create and then run uh, the enterprise uh, processes, right? So, uh, for example, for the university, this uh, could be, for example, you know, supporting the uh, student processes, uh, uh, managing student questions, the applications, uh, or on the professor side, this, for example, could be uh, managing things such as uh, uh, scheduling courses, uh, travel special reimbursement, this kind of thing. So, uh, our uh, uh, CEO uh, says with, with his, uh, let's say, motto is uh, we make work flow. So it's, it's kind of, you know, we make work uh, better for people. Um, it was actually born uh, uh, 15 years ago now, essentially in the IT service uh, uh, space. And then from then, uh, from, let's say, that point, we kind of grew uh, to uh, customer uh, support management, HR, and now basically it covers all sorts of, let's say, uh, verticals, right? It's growing very, very fast. It's a 4 billion revenue uh, company uh, per, per, per year and it's growing 35% uh, a year, I think, since the start. So it's going, it's, uh, going very, very fast. And uh, most of, I would say, the large majority of big companies actually run on top of uh, service now. So, uh, what about uh, machine learning and, and service now? Uh, I would say we run, uh, we do all sorts of uh, machine learning. So we use AI in all parts of the platform. Um, I would say what is specific of uh, service now is uh, we don't just use uh, uh, machine learning. We actually uh, build it as part of the platform as a product. And that's kind of interesting because when you do this, you also need to think a lot, not just about the algorithm, but if you need to think at how users will understand it and use it, right? And uh, we're, we're actually dealing with something new here. So we are building probabilistic uh, 
computing, right? which don't really give you a definite answer. It gives you a probabilistic one, right? And many customers do not find it easy at the start to, to actually grasp this, right? So a lot of basically what we do is uh, thinking not just of the algorithm, but how to make it easy for people to consume what we actually offer them, right? Uh, uh, specifically, I think we do a uh, lot of the, let me say classical AI, but uh, because we deal a lot with text, because most, uh, lots of our processes are customer support processes. So we do a lot uh, of uh, AI for, you know, for uh, text. And I will say also a very interesting uh, aspect, which was new to me as uh, uh, the fact that, you know, when you are a cloud company and you're trying to build ML uh, in the platform for a cloud company, it turns out that there are a million different things that you need to do be besides coming up with the greatest and, and most fantastic algorithms, right? Uh, so uh, when I joined, uh, one colleague showed me a slide that said, you know, uh, the algorithm is 5% of the problem. And I thought that was crazy, but it's entirely true. So, so there is, so many things you must do uh, to make a machine learning solution works. Uh, that's re that is really impressive, especially if you want it to work at scale efficiently, right? So that's why I'm particularly happy with the uh, flavor of this uh, degree, because you really guys focus on systems and the focusing on systems is really essential. And unless you do this, you will never be, uh, be able to offer a solution that the uh, customer can actually use. Right? So, um, Fabio, given also your background, I wanted to ask you a, a difficult question because you're going to have to split some hair here. Uh, students often uh, now and also next week, I'm sure they will ask, what's the relation between a master in degree in computer science and one a master in artificial intelligence system? Is there any better? Is there a primacy? Um, what kind of skills are you looking? And given also your latest statements, maybe there is some, some points to be made. Well, what is your take on this? I mean, how do you recruit? You recruit computer science students, AI? What, what do you do? So we actually hire all sorts of students exactly for the reason I, I said before. Uh, we actually need to take care of the entire uh, pipeline. So from the creation of the algorithm to actually putting the algorithm in the product and then running at scale with thousands of, thousands of customers using um, uh, training uh, uh, models concurrently and making predictions. And we need to, we need to do this very, uh, very efficiently, right? Uh, because if we don't do this, then we are not able to offer the product at the price point, which is actually reasonable uh, for the user. Uh, so we're hiring, I would will, I will say, all over the place uh, from, you know, software engineer, uh, testing, product managers, uh, to uh, scientists with deep knowledge of math and of the algorithm. Uh, in terms of what to choose, uh, I am a bit biased because I really love uh, my, my, my job, right? But really, AI is a super interesting field. Uh, you tend to, to have the chance to solve problems that really have a direct impact on people's life. Uh, and you really can, you know, literally see it. That is also true for whatever you do, right? But in AI, I found this, uh, this connection is particularly direct, right? So it's really very satisfying to work in this field. Uh, you touch on a lot of super interesting things, such as you touch the systems, uh, you touch the networking part, you touch performance, you touch complexity, you touch software, in software engineering in a very difficult uh, way in the sense that uh, you're trying to build something uh, and with AI, you really don't know how, how well it's gonna work. So there's much more, let's say uncertainty, which makes it, I think, much more fun. Uh, even testing, which is a fairly well understood, let's say, topic in software engineering, in AI, it's completely different, right? So it's very interesting. Uh, and then you also, also have, your, uh, let's say, the uh, side bonuses, uh, your friends think that, that you are kind of a genius magician, which is not true, but you know, that's what, what people think, and you end up making lots of money, which is also good, right? So all these things are you know, good, and, and they come with this, right? Uh, the downside is that it's, uh, it's tough to keep up. There is so many things happening that you cannot really relax, right? So you 
go on a holiday for three weeks <laughs> come back you know the world has changed so you really need, need to keep up right and um, so in terms of what we look for i think uh, uh, when we uh, hire people we look people with uh, uh, first of all i would say very strong foundations right so if you are working on this field uh, exactly because the field is changing so rapidly i think it's more important to build very very strong foundations uh, and you know yes this this means you know math statistics uh, linear algebra if you master these things you will never be afraid you know to tackle any problem right but if you do if, if you don't uh, then you always be scared in, you know in even actually having uh, let's say conversations on, on these topics right so it's that's really important right uh, you need to know systems and that's why i'm very happy of what I've, I've seen right so you really need to know software engineering networking performance complexity you really need to master all these things uh, and you really need to know how to abstract and model the problem so these are things we clearly look and then we have you know the usual soft skills right that are always so important like uh, the ability to let's say communicate being helpful being collaborative being curious and having the willingness to stay up to date, uh, being dependable. Those are, I would say, the main things we look for when we look for a person. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure the students and actually everybody, even us as educators, um, will will think about it. It's very important. So now I'll have a few more questions, but we'll leave it for the end. Uh, we now move uh, actually not very far away from Palo Alto, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and we call to the stage Sergei Tuliakov. Sergei, there you go. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi, Sergei. So actually I'm pleased to uh, introduce Sergei because he's a um, you know, relatively young alumni. I hope you take this as a compliment um, of the University of Trento. He left the University of Trento a few years ago when uh, he got his PhD from this department and now he's in Los Angeles at um, uh, SNAP. So I really would like to hear from him about, you know, what do you do in, uh, in your company and what your team is doing just to get the students understand really what is an AI uh, 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 background, a student with the AI background could end up doing. So get a sense of that. Sergei. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the good thing with vision is that you're usually able to show the results. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you for introduction. Indeed, I graduated from the University of Toronto in 2017. I did a PhD at the Department of information engineering. And uh, now I'm uh, like a lead research scientist at SNAP Research, and we do lots of things. And I'm going to share some of them uh, today. And basically, I want to show like what role vision algorithms play in uh, AI systems. And I would like to maybe start with this quote that you might have heard. Uh, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And I think uh, this one is really important to highlight the role what uh, vision systems uh, do. They basically do two things. They create and understand, understand first. So uh, vision system help us understand environment, like reconstruct environment, understand objects. And then given this understanding, they can actually create new content. And I will show some examples of that. And empowered with these two abilities, uh, systems can, uh, can create very compelling AR experiences that I'm going to show. So for example, uh, in order to do something with humans, in order to offer something to them, you need first to understand them. So here I show that we reconstruct the face and we uh, reconstruct different parts of the face, identify those parts. When we do that, we can actually overlay some AR on top of it, and it looks like it's a tattoo on the face. It's very robust and uh, uh, looks like as if it's painted on the face. The same thing you can do with hands and other parts of the body. Again, so uh, here vision systems can help us understand 
uh, the user. And uh, with this type of understanding, you can, for example, uh, try to understand this type of uh, subject and uh, create interesting experiences uh, for the users. Similarly, you can understand the world. And for example, if you're nearby um, an Eiffel Tower, we can recognize that. And also we can register your mobile phone to that Eiffel Tower and, and can apply some AR on top of it. And similarly, if you know where the floor is, you can replace the floor with some interesting content such as lava or water. And also you can put objects into the sky if you know where the sky is. And here, I think you, you, you should see that the whale uh, is behind the trees. So it, the system understands where the sky is, where the trees are and uh, can create similar experiences. This part was understanding. When you understand the environment, you can apply some graphical augmentation such as put artificial objects there, uh, but also uh, vision system have to, systems have to have uh, creativity. They can create experiences directly. For example, uh, by having two people, you can create uh, an image of their child, how their child would look like because you understand uh, how the face is formed and what are the major parts. Then uh, I'm pretty sure some of you have seen this feature in Snapchat uh, which was released around a year ago. So this is the first real-time neural lens that runs on the majority of phones and that can uh, realistically change your gender such that you cannot actually even tell in some, in some cases that is generated. And finally, since we understand how uh, people age, we can teach a machine what are the key features uh, of aging and the machine can uh, basically interpolate your face from very young to very old. And, uh, and this is a very smooth interpolation. It's actually very photorealistic. I think that's all I wanted to share. And uh, I'm open to questions okay. if there are right. any. All right, thank you, Sergey. So uh, that's fantastic creatures that you're creating there. So I guess a, um, natural question these days in the field is this one. So I will not keep this for the end. I will do it now. Although I would like to ask you to keep it short. <laughs> uh, but mm -hmm. basically it's about ethical implication of mm -hmm. the work that you do and uh, that somebody else uh, could use. Uh, yeah. So of course, you know what I'm referring to, the fakes, counterfeits, and so forth. How are you taking into account when you do research, develop technology, ethical requirements? A short answer. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a great question. I very often get this question. Um, so first of all, I would like to note that this thing is not very new. So it's as old as photography, and we've seen like... Uh, many people faking photographs like uh, maybe even like 100 years ago when they just appeared. So uh, what happens right now is that these technologies become more publicly available and easier. And I think this is not necessarily bad. This is actually uh, good from a medical standpoint because people actually know that these tools are available and they will do fact checking when necessary. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, part of the work we do is also detecting those deep fakes. Uh, we can create them for, to allow some interesting experiences, but we can also make sure that these are our deep fakes. And, and there are a lot of research and also in other companies that try to reconstru uh, rec recognize that this is actually generated versus real. And they also try to tell which part of the image is actually synthesized and stuff like that. So this is a very short answer. Uh, yeah, there are more things to tell here, but in short, this is the answer. Okay, so, well, the last question for you, Sergei, uh, basically we have students here on the other side listening to um, you know, this panel and your presentation. Is there any advice you would like to give to them when they're planning their 
graduate studies in terms of what you know something yeah. you learn from your your story or somebody else's story there are a couple of advice i can give first learn the basics i think uh as, as Fabio has mentioned, that the world changes in, uh, that so quickly, but basics are the basics. Uh, if you know them, you will be able to catch up pretty much in any field after that. Those basics include mathematics, optimization, systems, and, and uh, of course, uh, programming. Second, I would advise to do what you really like and to find uh, uh, things that you feel you enjoy, then you will have, you will will not have to work. You will just do what you like, and you get money for that and enjoy the process. That's pretty much uh, the main advice I can give. Okay. Well, thank you, Sergey. Of course, stick around for the uh, uh, end of the uh, panel for more Q and A. And now we'll call on the stage uh, Roberto Sicconi. Hi, Beppe. How are you doing? Hi, Roberto. So Roberto has spent significant amount of years, I will not disclose how many, um, in a very important research labs in the world, in particular at IBM in Italy and then Yorktown uh, Heights, uh, the last 15 years maybe. Um, he works on the East Coast, uh, Danbury, Connecticut, and then the last two or three years, he decided to uh, put himself on the spot and decided to take on the challenge and found a startup. So Roberto, tell us about your startup mission and how technology, AI technology is helping or will help your company take off. Yes, yeah, thank you, pleasure being here. Um, Drive is a startup that decided to attack the problem of uh, distracted and drowsy driving. Um, it's, a, it's a major phenomenon here in the States particularly distracted driving, even more than in Europe. And it's uh, causing <clears throat> anywhere between 50 and $100 billion in uh, costs, damages, uh, lost lives. Um, right now, I think there's of the 6 million uh, crashes per year, one and a half million are caused by distracted driving. So it's a pretty serious phenomenon. Um, we decided to go first uh, with commercial vehicles, professional drivers who are on the road all the time. Uh, more exposed to these issues. Not that they are the most distracted ones, uh, but they, they are at, at the point where a crash caused by a big uh, tractor trailer can cause a much bigger damages uh, and more uh, lives uh, lost. So uh, this, uh, it's a space that is uh, essential to the economy in the uh, States. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, drivers are safe, um, both inside uh, their trucks and inside the cars. So I, let me play back a little uh, video that shows an example of how the system works, and then I will make additional comments. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we are using a phone-based uh, application with an external infrared camera that looks at the driver. You hear a few sounds, a warning sound, and spoken start. messages. Calibrating. Uh, alerts. We monitor different aspects of the driving. Cornering. Particularly braking, acceleration, cornering, speeding. Extreme braking. And most important, we uh, okay. Speed break. restored. Heart breaking. And we monitor distracted driving. We give the warnings. Uh. Distracted. And we do the same with drowsy driving, analyzing different stages. Uh, the second camera looks at the road and identifies the moving vehicles on the road. In this case, uh, pedestrians and uh, cars. Um, and tries to understand uh, the level of risk. Uh, so each object is classified based on urgency and the risk level. And then if the driver is not paying attention, stop it. if the driver is not paying attention, then we speak up and alert the driver. 
Uh, the, the sounds are uh, specific to the different items. Uh, so there's different ones for cars, uh, trucks, uh, motorcycles, pedestrians. If you're not looking at the road and something's happening before you that requires your attention, we play that sound. The sound fades uh, and moves uh, in space uh, to give a sense of where the, uh, the object is. If you uh, regain attention and, want, and, and look for what uh, requires your attention. So in the end, uh, we want to be a complement to human attention. The driver is still at the wheel and is supposed to uh, take the action, but we want to give as much uh, ahead the warning, to make sure that uh, uh, drivers can, can safely uh, drive and, and be <coughs> called back to attention whenever needed. Uh, there's different levels of AI implied here. Uh, we have a sensor level, um, typical, te typical techniques uh, like uh, neural networks, deep learning applied to computer vision inside the cabin and outside uh, the car. And then we applying machine learning to the dialogue with the, with the driver. And the higher level, we are working on analyzing the responsiveness of the driver over time and create a risk of behavior or attitude to risk of the individual driver. And this is for the benefit of the driver who gets coached, for the fleet manager who wants to know who is the best drivers, for the insurance to understand the level of risk that the driver is getting into. All right, so Roberto, um, I mean, that's quite impressive. And the first question that comes to mind, I have any questions, but the first one is how complex is such system also with respect to the integration, if any, with the technology that is in the car? Well, by design, um, since the majority of the vehicles that does not have a cameras installed, uh, we decided to go with an aftermarket solution. In uh, the commercial vehicle space, uh, there is a price limit uh, in the order of $500 or so that gives you a little bit of a freedom in terms of uh, how much technology you can put in. Uh, when it comes to cars, uh, the level of cost is close to zero. So ideally, uh, both the driver and the insurance would like to see a zero cost or close to zero cost of hardware installed in the, in the car. Um, and that's a big limitation. Uh, remember that uh, anything related to safety cannot be done on the cloud. <clears throat> there are latency uh, issues that uh, prevent even before, uh, even when 5G is going to be around, but right now it's not. Uh, it's not going to be possible to have uh, sub-second uh, uh, analysis of uh, the, the conditions, the risk conditions, and, and provide uh, adequate uh, communication with the driver. So everything has, everything has to run in the cabin and it has to be very cheap. And that, that's, a, that's the biggest challenge. So applying sophisticated uh, AI techniques uh, on uh, inexpensive hardware makes things uh, very complex. Um, on the other hand, there are advantages uh, in being able to uh, work with both edge computing and cloud-based uh, processing. Um, many of the analysis that can be done post mortem, if you allow me to determine this case, uh, of course, this is what we want to avoid. <laughs> um, but uh, we can analyze behaviors uh, and analyze risks, uh, risk factors, uh, and then also analyze uh, data to perf uh, improve the models on the go as we collect more data and then stream them back to the edge device. And then the edge device is going to do them in real time. So it's, uh, it's a highly uh, cost uh, and time constrained environment where we have very difficult tasks to perform. Um, but in the end, we are talking about the very large population, so we can create very complex models on the cloud and, and distribute them for the benefit of everybody on the road. So once again, systems and quite complex systems. Um, well, I still wanted to ask you this quest, recurring question, which is uh, kind of um, uh, underlining any of the work we do in AI, which is what, how big is the issue of data uh, privacy and um, ethical issues in a short answer. Yes, uh, data privacy is uh, in, in general issue, it's, um, it's kind, of, kind of perceived differently in the States than it is in Europe. In Europe, uh, it's a little more organized uh, and some people may not like it the way it is, but at least uh, there is a structure behind it. Um, in the States, uh, things are left uh, to the, um, I would say a product developer. Um, there is no government intervention yet. Uh, California is moving with a very interesting uh, law that requires management of uh, private information similar to GDPR, <clears throat> but it's uh, still uh, in progress, a work in progress. Uh, in the rest of the states are uh, just uh, looking at it. Um, uh, when, when it comes uh, to being in front of a camera that watches you all the time, everybody has some hesitation. Um, 
it's it's natural. Uh, we are not used to being in front of a camera. I guess uh, at these times with COVID, everybody getting into uh, into Zoom and webinars every day, um, the the reaction is a little milder now. But um, we we feel a little uncomfortable uh, knowing that there is something watching us. Now, if that something watching us is a is an algorithm and it's running on a device that we own, and then we can control what information is. Uh, uh, gets transferred from the device to the network, uh, then the reaction is uh, softened. Uh, one of the things that we have done as part of the system, we have the ability to obfuscate uh, or completely obliterate uh, the image of the driver uh, from the video recording so that whatever goes to the cloud uh, carries uh, the face marks, but not the face. And then we can still tell there is a person looking up and down, eyes closed, uh, open uh, three times in a minute or so, and extract all the information that we need uh, to uh, uh, evaluate the profile without disclosing the identity. In reality, we discovered uh, in the pilots we, uh, we started last year that the, most of the drivers uh, uh, slowly get uh, used to this uh, and they're okay with uh, having their own pictures uh, sent over as long as they can benefit. For instance, uh, if you are drowsy often, um, the first time you see yourself again drowsy, you get scared because you don't realize how bad the situation was. So it is really a good uh, way of uh, watching yourself, uh, having a system uh, <clears throat> uh, act on, on, on those findings, but also provide you the evidence so that you can see yourself uh, how you were doing. <clears throat> At that point, uh, the reluctance uh, to be to use uh, the, uh, your own um, information it goes down. Uh, longer term, um, I think this is uh, probably common to everybody who is working with the AI applied to faces. Uh, the bigger issue is uh, how to deal with information that is definitely identifiable um, and how do you control it. So if you may be uh, willing to disclose it to your uh, fleet manager, who is your boss, so to speak, but you don't want anybody else to see it. Uh, and then at some point you leave the company, you want to be able to remove all that information so that it doesn't stay in the archives, um, similar to what the GDPR does. And so the, uh, I think the key is uh, um, let the driver, uh, the owner of the data, be the owner of the data, and then have a, a, an agile system that allows the driver anytime to decide who gets access to what information and have the ability to revoke it uh, if something changes. Okay, Roberto, thank you. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, there will be more discussion maybe later, but I wanted to have this um, ask up front. Okay, uh, so we now call on the floor, uh, Cristiano Motto. Hi, okay. Hi, Cristiano. Good evening to everyone. So Cristiano uh, has spent uh, many years in um, the banking industry um, and he has started recently a new consulting practice for Teradata, Teradata in uh, Singapore in the fintech sector, and um, maybe somebody familiar or not. Cristiano, tell us where you work and how is AI changing or will change the way you build services or engage customers? Yeah, well, I'm the director of the financial services consulting practice of Teradata in ANAPAC. Teradata is a leader in delivering data and analytics solution to many customers, we are serving pretty all the top players in financial services across the globe. And we are helping them to leverage data and analytics uh, uh, to transform the way they are working to fit with the new paradigm of the digital era. And, and we are seeing artificial intelligence uh, coming to the scene and changing the way in which financial services are working, are adopting analytics. Uh, let me show you an infographic that uh, will give you some highlights on what the industry is doing. So if we look at the situation on financial services, financial services are living one of the most challenging moments of their life they are facing several challenges from the market uh, due to the changes in the socioeconomic uh, landscape, new digital native population with millennials and, and Gen Zeta looking to come to the banking uh, and, and financial services industry just through digital channels, mobile only channels, and with a complete new different approach in comparison with the previous generation. At the same time, the economic situation, the financial market, 
are not enabling the previous level of, of margins and growth, and banks and financial services has to find new way, a new business model, better fitting what the digital era is. And the third challenge is clearly what other players that are native digital are, are doing. Like you probably know, Amazon has asked for a financial services license in 2016, Facebook, Facebook as well, Google has launched a financial service unit in 2017. What banks and financial services are trying to do, they are trying to move digital to answer the challenges of this transformation. And if we look how they are facing their digital transformation, we can see three main streams in that. An external transformation that is go digital and including your digital solution as much as possible, data analytics and artificial intelligence to grow the revenue, an internal transformation. So apply new logic, new processes, and improve the automation and improve the intelligence internally to improve the efficiency and then reduce the cost. And a transversal one, because unfortunately, financial services are one of the most regulated sector in industry. And while they are growing revenues, while they are improving efficiency, they have to stay compliance with what the law and what the regulators of the several country and international level are asking. What we see as Teradata, what we are doing as Teradata, is to enable our customer to achieve those goals through the use of data analytics at scale. We trust data R is the new oil, and in a digital era, data are flowing across every single component of our socioeconomic system. They are enabling a new economy and a new social uh, model. And like in the past, our engines were burning carbon to move, now they are burning data. We are building engines that are mainly artificial intelligence engines that are burning those data to enable a new economy and a new social model. And if we look what those models are and how artificial intelligence comes into the loop, well, financial services like all the other industry are mainly using artificial intelligence for two main topics. Intelligence, make decision or support decision that will consume a wider set of data that normally uh, could not be consumed in the current decision engines and automation. Uh, artificial intelligence could enable machines to do work that until a few times ago were impossible, like reading a document and understanding it, or look at a picture and understand it, or hear a phone call and understand it. And create an automation is clearly one of the most important part to improve the efficiency of every company, even more financial services that has never been one of the most efficient uh, uh, industry in the world. I know that financial services is not considered normally as one of the top player as industry for artificial intelligence. But I can tell you that from what we are seeing serving our customer across the globe in the last years, artificial intelligence is taking a very key role in financial services as in any other industries. We are serving customers that are using speech analytics and AI on speech to understand their interaction with the customer on the call center, address specific topic, classify the call, understand if the call is, an, is a claim, control the compliance of each call and so on. We are seeing uh, other financial services using computer vision, monitoring the people moving in a branch to define the landscape and the design of the new branches for the future. We are talking with financial services company using machine learning and sophisticated technology like graph technologies to address pattern analysis for scoring, rating, churn, and many other purposes. Many users, uh, many institutions are already using text analytic, uh, natural language processing, natural language understanding to analyze document, to extract information from them. And you have probably seen many of the banks 
and many of the insurances are already using conversational interfaces to create new way to interact with their customer with chatbot and with supported call centers. So a very interesting uh, shift, a very interesting opportunity. Financial services are not classified as probably one of the industry consuming more artificial intelligence than other, but it's quite a wrong understanding. They are a very interesting field where and artificial intelligence is growing up a lot. Just to give you a size, the forecast is that by 2023, the global market of analytics that include financial uh, that include artificial intelligence for financial services will be sized about 27.8 billion dollar. So that could give you a size of how much important could be this market. Giuseppe, can I ask a question? A, yeah. uh, can we keep that question for later because we uh, run a, okay. a little bit okay. uh, out of time? In fact, uh, Cristiano was already answering some of the questions that I had, but a few have left and I'll keep it for, for the last part. Thank you, Cristiano. So um, now let's move on with the uh, uh, panelists and I would like to call on stage uh, Giuseppe Pino Di Fabrizio. Yes, there you are. Hi. So, uh, everyone. Pino, Pino Di Fabrizio also is a long timer uh, in the area of AI. They worked uh, first at Telecom Italia Research Lab called Xelt, and then uh, passed um, FANS, went to uh, Bell Laboratories, AT&T Labs, and then a trip into Amazon. And finally, he started his own startup uh, uh, kind of two years ago. And uh, he's obsessed about making machine, computer, and social robot talk to humans for some good reasons. <laughs> and uh, so, Pino, can you tell us about what is conversational AI and what is your startup about it? Yes, absolutely. And um, thank you very much for this opportunity, Giuseppe. And thank you to the director for the initiative. This is great. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, let, let, me, let me share um, my, a few slides here. I mean, uh, if I can figure this out in a second. Um, here. Yes. Um, so let me tell you briefly what, what is this company about so that we can actually have a grounding, um, you know, discussion, grounded mm -hmm. discussion. I mean, uh, we are um, you know, a small startup founded in, in 2018, um, around uh, 18 uh, people in the, in the team. and. Um, we are located in Boston and in Trenton. Actually, I want to mention that uh, most of the core uh, science team um, is located in Trenton. We have uh, uh, six permanent employees uh, uh, there with, um, uh, all of them are alumni from uh, uh, the University of Trento. And um, plus we have an intern and, and we, we, we found that this combination of uh, collaboration with the university and uh, um, uh, our business goals uh, are absolutely uh, 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 profitable, I mean, pro uh, absolutely uh, productive uh, for, for our company. Um, so we, we are focused on uh, conversational AI. Um, so the conversational AI, as you know, is a very interdisciplinary uh, topic. It involves linguistics, it involves, uh, you know, machine learning and deep learning, of course, uh, also um, analytics uh, and, um, you know, interaction, um, dialogue uh, management. Uh, there, there are many topics that there are somehow orthogonal. Um, also, like Roberto mentioned, there is a one, one uh, issue or challenge that is super important about privacy and making sure that the data we collect through the user are actually securely uh, managed. Um, so, uh, in the, so conversational AI in, in a way is um, uh, something which um, I'll, I'll define in, in a three different components if you, if you want. I mean, uh, so one, as you are familiar probably with um, um, chatbots, I mean, that's one way to um, interact with, with users. Um, so and that's um, a typical um, system, which is not fully, um, uh, under, it doesn't have a, a full understanding of the context of the conversation. Um, you probably saw a few examples, so like, uh, you know, the um, Microsoft chatbot, and um, it's trying to mimic a human interaction and it's trying to be social. 
it, it doesn't provide uh, the full experience that someone may want to refer a full conversational system. Um, so another type of um, you know, conversational type of interaction is definitely in what we call question answering. Uh, so question answering is, um, has been uh, very popular in, in the recent time and it's trying to uh, provide factoid, uh, um, so answers to factoid questions. Uh, it provides um, a way to understand uh, documents and then extract information uh, in the context of that document to answer questions. And, and this is also, um, you know, somehow um, a form of um, uh, talking with machines if you want, but it really has a, a very shallow context and is not uh, useful if you have complex uh, problems. I, I mean, in, in a way, um, so what do we want is, um, you know, for a conversational system is to have a, a, a way to um, solve a problem. So, you know, we want a task-driven uh, system which understand in a collaborative fashion what the user wants and, and helps the, the user to uh, solve um, a real uh, concrete problem. Um, so this, those three type of uh, um, interactions, uh, I will say they're combined together. In my opinion, I mean, uh, uh, what we call, you know, a conversation of AI. I mean, you should be able to provide a, a fully natural interaction with a machine. You should be able to uh, uh, respond to social questions or, um, or chit chat or small talk uh, like a chat bot. At the same time, you should be able to answer questions that are very factual. But you know, in in keep in mind that you're trying to solve a real problem for a customer. Um, so the combination of those three type of interaction, it's what we call and we define conversational AI. And, um, and what we're trying to do at VUI is to um, have a system which is uh, complete and uh, natural in terms of interaction uh, to cover all these different topics. So in a way, um, so maybe I'll try to the next slides, I'll show you an example of that. Welcome to VUI. How can I help you today? I would like to know when my order will be delivered. Your most recent order has shipped with an expected arrival on Monday, March 3rd. Is there anything else I can help you with today? If it doesn't fit, how can I exchange the order? Of course, for a rapid exchange, you can call our customer service specialists at 888-678-5576 to place your new order and process the exchange. Is there anything further I can help you with? Can I exchange in-store? Yes, here's our closest store location. Can I help you with anything else? Can you show me a red petite-sized dress that can be machine washed? Here's what we have available. Does it come in charcoal? No, but it does come in river blue. Here's a similar style dress in washed gray. I am also looking for a pair of red shoes in size 9. Here's some shoes that are available in red. Do you have it in black? Unfortunately, they only come in navy and red. You're very smart. Thank you. The more we talk, the better I can assist you. Okay, so as you can see, um, this example combined all together, all the concepts we mentioned before in terms of, um, you know, chit chat, you know, the capability to answer questions and capability to under context uh, in the conversation in uh, providing a real service uh, to the user, something which is valuable. Um, and in that specific domain, that was e-commerce but it can be applied to many other domains. So, you know, one quick question, especially thinking about the students on the other side, what are you looking for in a student, a fresh graduate, uh, kind of a master graduate? Um, so I, I think we, we, we have um, um, experience with many students and I think what we appreciate uh, is the capability of solve problems so the capability to be independent in terms of uh, you know facing a, um, a new uh, ambiguous um, you know uh, challenge, and the capability to experiment uh, with different options and without you know what are the uh, less uh, um, interesting uh, um, you know solutions. So I think that's that's very important because we, we found that um, 
uh, students, uh, you know, freshly graduated, they're super, very smart and very uh, um, definitely willing to learn and curious. Uh, but, you know, a little bit of experience of uh, acquired taste for machine learning um, uh, helps to understand what, what are the better, best solution you can actually uh, apply um, in, in a situation where there is a lot of ambiguity. And that, that is actually, um, you know, we're trying to do that all the time in terms of, uh, you know, exploring and exploiting. Um, and and, and we, we appreciate that quality uh, very much. Okay. Thank you, Pino. So uh, we now uh, move on to uh, the next speaker. Actually, I would like to uh, Luigi to chair this um, yes. uh, panelist. Uh, yes, I think uh, I cannot access to the to the video. So if uh, Elisabetta can help me with that. Anyway, let me let me just introduce you, Giulio Vivo, who is a senior specialist at Centro Ricerche Fiat. He has worked quite for some time in the area of computer vision, inspection, robotic guidance knowledge-based vision to the and 3D pattern recognition. And he is particularly expert nowadays in the application of AI technologies to the so-called uh, Industry 4.0 domain. So I would like to know from him the perspective of Centro Ricerche Fiat, which represents one of the largest car manufacturers in the world on AI, robotics, and Industry 4.0. Uh, I will uh, start uh, your video for you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you, Luigi. Yeah, give me a few seconds. It hung out, I don't know what happens. Okay, no. <laughs> oh, so, no way. <laughs> uh, for some reason, Zoom kicked me out, so I'm sorry about this. So, but now you should- uh... Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So, finally, the, this, uh, this uh, running video is about uh, the role of artificial intelligence and uh, on human-robot collaboration in car factoring. As you can see, uh, how the ergonomics and automation solutions are implemented in a typical production environment. There are uh, automation systems, a uh, conveyor uh, where uh, assembly activities are carried out in continuous moving. There are uh, automatic drawers uh, that open and close in synchronicity with the assembly process. And uh, the location shown in the video is uh, relevant for historical reason. It's uh, the famous workshop number three of thermally plant. We can talk about afterwards. Okay, here uh, you can see another example of automation. It is in the casino settlement uh, where the butterfly system from Comau is adopted. It is uh, the modern version. Uh, the name of the butterfly is due to the more than 200 robots all coordinating a synchronous flight around uh, the vehicle body to execute more than 5,000 welding points in uh, less than one minute. Uh, also, the RoboGate is a very interesting invention. Uh, we can spend some words about afterwards. Um, however, the point is that the increasing automation uh, implies to decrease the flexibility. And flexibility is a fundamental uh, concept since uh, nowadays uh, the paradigm of the modern uh, uh, production is moving from the concept of the mass production to the new paradigm, which is the one of the customized production. In this context, uh, the, the role of the human robot collaboration is crucial, leveraging both on the robotic features uh, of the precision, repeatability, and mechanical force, and on the human features of the analytics based uh, data, the reactivities uh, to unplanned events, uh, the sensing of vision and acoustic agent, uh, where uh, there is a workstation centered around the, the human operator. And of course, the role uh, into the context has been shown robots uh, to carry out uh, more cognitive tasks 
and to make uh, autonomous decisions uh, based on real-time environmental data. That's uh, more or less all from my side. Okay, good. Uh, Julia, uh, it's interesting to understand what type of uh, AI professionals do you look for in order to boost this type of revolution in uh, uh, manufacturing? Uh, that's, uh, in fact, <laughs> a, a, a very good question. And, uh, and uh, it's useful also to reply to the reasonable fears uh, that uh, AI, uh, about the AI that, uh, that, that will at the end replace uh, human workers in all of the economy. But that's a wrong perspective, of course. Uh, never before uh, the digital tools have been so responsive and uh, adaptive. So uh, artificial intelligence will change radically uh, how the job is accomplished. It, it will change who does the job, but uh, the technology larger impact uh, will be in uh, complementing, uh, augmenting the human capabilities, not uh, in replies to them. To, to make a, a very quick and short answer, the specific jobs in charge to AI professionals uh, could be in, in our domain and the one of the, of, the, of the automotive industry, the figures of the software uh, analysts and developers, uh, computer scientists, uh, computer engineers, uh, specialists on, on algorithm and machine learning solution. Uh, and mechanical engineers, maintenance experts, manufacturing engineers, uh, the sort of figures. So the, the ones uh, you are growing uh, with uh, your uh, new uh, course, of, <laughs> I would say. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. It's been a very a nice intervention. I think we will have more time for uh, other questions later. Unfortunately, there were some technical <laughs> problem. I think uh, we have... Uh, we have solved it. Okay, uh, so thank you very much. I will move uh, uh, now to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, uh, Stefano Divan. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you Stefano because he's been one of my most uh, brilliant uh, PhD students in the past years. He has worked with my team in important research projects on the application of robots to elderly assistance and post-traumatic rehabilitation. And it's important because at the end of the, the PhD, he took an important decision. Rather than going for the easy way, just looking for a job, he decided to start his own uh, company, teaming up with uh, his, his colleagues. Uh, which is Dolomite Robotics, and uh, uh, they are trying to develop a revolutionary application in the area of robotics for logistics and hospitals of the future. Uh, I would like to see more of this, and uh, uh, for this reason, I will start the, uh, the, the, the clip for you. Thank you, Luigi. Okay, um, give me a few seconds because... <clears throat> Okay, share. There it is. Okay. 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 Thank you, Luigi, for your introduction. So Dolomite Robotics was born from robotics and automation researchers. Uh, we provide our industrial partners uh, with tools and ideas to boost innovation in their production sites and to create innovative products. We build intelligent guided vehicles for logistics and manufacturing, and our robots are able to build them up autonomously uh, with semantic annotation. Uh, thanks to the artificial intelligence uh, technologies, we don't include persons, boxes, or the other movable objects. The most important goal for nowadays industries is the flexibility. Our robot and persons are connected together via cyber physical interfaces and can share safely the same environment. The robot can be remotely called by the user and depends the safest route to reach him. The planners exploit uh, social aware algorithms providing to the robot a social accepted behavior. Since the robot and the person are interconnected, even if the user moves once the robot has been called, the planner uh, in real time replans the plan to reach him. Once the robot has been loaded, then the user can decide to send him everywhere in the plant, 
either predefined or customized positions. If the robot meets unexpected obstacles, like in this case, uh, during its motion, the planner automatically tries to overtake the obstacle if, if it is feasible with the map. Other artificial intelligence help us to detect humans and moving obstacles predicting their behavior. In the logistic environment, it is very, very important to help the user in repetitive tasks. So artificial intelligence help us to detect the pellets and estimate their pose so we provide the robot the ability to work it completely autonomously. So what I can say is that Dormitory Robotics studies and develops advanced solutions that allows mobile robotics to become collaborative and we want to put human at the center. We don't want to replace the human. So robot and the user has to collaborate in synergy and in harmony in order to achieve a common goal, which is a fundamental concept in our data factories. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. Uh, so your, your, your work uh, seems to complement very well the talk of uh, Julia that we have just seen uh, before. Uh, my, my, my question to you is that, okay, you are an industrial researcher and you decided to team up with your workmates to create a startup at the end of your PhD. Why, what did you make, what did you push to make such a bold uh, choice? And uh, why, uh, why do you think uh, uh, it's important, if it is, to do this step after taking a graduate uh, course like uh, like this. Well, what, what I can say is that uh, this is a very innovative and emerging market where companies uh, see uh, very promising opportunities uh, in terms of founding and growing. So, what we found is that most of these factories uh, don't, doesn't doesn't don't, don't have the ability and the flexibility to exploit such opportunities. And this is why we decided to found our startup. And we found out that if someone has great ideas and the right competencies, it is possible to be creative and be very successful business. From my point of view, this is very inspiring. And since we can always deal with difficult and challenging tasks, so we can like never get bored. This doing a graduate, graduate course is very important because it gives you the ability to be much flexible as possible in order to adapt you to the problem solving because uh, you have to be very, very dynamic and very flexible to adapt to, so, to, to solve uh, new challenges and issues. Okay, thank you very much. If there are if there is time later, maybe we can ask an additional question. But at the, at the moment, for the moment being, I would leave the floor to the next uh, speaker, Giuseppe. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we are at the um, end, and uh, it's an honor to have uh, Marco Zanati. I met Marco um, three years ago on our way to Boston for very different reasons. <laughs> But now we have a common interest, which is keeping us uh, uh, busy and in touch, which is AI in medicine, of course, from different angles. He's professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. He's also director of the medical robotic surgery. And in his spare time, has invented by Inspire robots for heart surgery. So, Marco, how is ch AI changing or will change medicine, the way doctors operate? patients follow therapies and so forth. So, um, first of all, thank you, Beppe, for the invitation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to join this webinar from uh, Boston, uh, Massachusetts, where I teach uh, uh, at Harvard Medical School. And uh, <clears throat> your, your question, uh, you know, requ will require probably a similar amount of time that we had in February when you kindly invited me to speak uh, uh, the keynote lecture, and uh, I think for the students that are following us on YouTube, I think the lecture, uh, the slides are available, so they want to request them, uh, so that will give uh, them a much <clears throat> broader um, uh, in-depth answer to, to your question, uh, but uh, what uh, I, I wanted to um, say here is that, uh, to paraphrase uh, uh, Cristiano Motto from Teradata, who earlier said that uh, data is the new uh, oil in in medicine uh, data is becoming the new blood and uh, i uh, would like to uh, share a, a slide here uh, because uh, what uh, we have uh, seen in the last few years is um, that in this uh, field of healthcare um, which is a very complex uh, large field 
and incorporates not only medicine and surgery, which is my field, but also genetics, physiology, pharmacology, and biology, um, there has been a, an explosion of uh, data. Um, um, just, just to give you one number, uh, electronic health records in the United States alone per year generate about 200 exabytes, so about 200 billion gigabytes of data every year, just uh, electronic health records. That's, this is an ocean of data. And the problem is that uh, this accumulation of medical data um, has resulted in healthcare professionals uh, and also patients um, being responsible for aggregating, synthesizing, and interpreting data that are far beyond um, the human uh, cognitive and decision-making capacity. So there's been increasingly in medicine, healthcare, a mismatch between the ability of us of using and interpreting a, a, a vast uh, amount of data that we are generating every year, especially in these fields of uh, proteomics, uh, genomics, uh, metabolomics, uh, um, that is, uh, is increasing. Um, so this exponential data accumulation challenges the limits of human uh, cognitive capacities. And this is where AI algorithms really excel. Uh, because they require large volumes uh, of training data. And uh, to this end, uh, multiple standards uh, uh, have been uh, uh, proposed to promote uh, data aggregation, both uh, data at rest and data in motion. Uh, also, blockchain has been used. So I, I, I think it's important, uh, not only for the students that, that are considering their master for AI, but also students are considering, for instance, studying medicine in Trento in the near future. We heard the, uh, Professor Collini mentioning a opening of a, a school of medicine in Trento. And uh, the, 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 the new uh, doctors uh, will need to be able to think like data scientists more and more and uh, understand data-based logic like never before. So this is our all new challenges that uh, were not there uh, even a few years ago. Uh, so we need to um, educate augmented doctors. We need to probably introduce new curriculum, uh, including like a doctor engineering mixed curriculum perhaps that uh, uh, uses uh, hard scientists in addition to computational sciences, coding, algorithms, uh, mechatronic engineering. Um, and the reason is because uh, um, in the future, um, AI applications will uh, be pervasive, will affect uh, uh, every stage of the human lifespan, uh, from, from birth to um, mental health, uh, to uh, interpreting imaging, uh, to uh, classify, identify cancer, uh, promote patient safety. Uh, and a lot of this uh, come from the ubiquitous presence of sensors. You know, for instance, one breakthrough was uh, the ability to have um, intelligent algorithms on the most re recent generation Apple watches, um, interpret EKG and infer uh, the level of uh, potassium in the, in the bloodstream without any blood sampling. Uh, so I could uh, you know, speak for, for a long time about uh, all these uh, advances. Uh, if uh, um, students are interested, I can refer them to Eric Topol's excellent review on nature medicine published uh, last year. Um, but uh, I believe uh, there, there is, we are facing really a, a we're at the cusp of, of a revolution in uh, healthcare and in medicine, uh, and uh, we, we need to be prepared. So I think those students are considering and the AI master uh, will probably find that, that uh, there will be tremendous opportunities in medicine and healthcare. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Marco. Well, um, you could have said better uh, in terms of uh, some of the challenges, some of the uh, opportunities. Uh, I mean, I wanted to close this panel with one question um, to you, uh, uh, and, um, and in particular, 
what's the uh, viscosity uh, of AI with respect to how people, how humans, how doctors are accepting it? Is that going to be a problem for the adoption of AI in the workflow on the human flow and um, how we can deal with that? So, uh, if, Beppe, if the question is for me, I think the, the, yeah, you can have, start. Yeah, we we have a challenge, uh, which is uh, um, availability of digital expertise. Um, it is not widespread. Uh, computer scientists approaching um, healthcare providers find that uh, most of them are unprepared to um, have, have conversation on a level field. So. Besides training the new generation of, uh, of doctors, we need to retrain the current uh, doctors uh, to this new reality. So that's why I meant, uh, you know, the ability to think like a data scientist, to to make abstractions, uh, to understand the database logic. I think it will be in, in really critical uh, in, in the future. And I think right now they are sorely um, lacking. Okay. Yeah. Beppe, if I, if yes, I Roberto, please. Yeah, based on. I uh, worked it uh, 10 years ago now uh, Watson, and I was the one pushing it in the health uh, direction. Uh, one of the biggest issues, uh, especially back then, uh, things have relaxed a little bit, but back then it was, uh, how do I know that the expertise is real expertise uh, mm -hmm. uh, reasoning? Uh, the biggest problem with the AI applied, especially deep learning, applied to um, lots of data is that it comes up with the quote unquote uh, rules in uh, making, <clears throat> uh, providing diagnosis or so that uh, may not be easily explainable to human experts. Uh, and as a reaction, human experts uh, don't trust it. And the reality is that uh, if you have no ability to supervise uh, the reasoning process, you cannot really rely on this. And I know that in all conditions, the AI is going to come up with a pretty plausible uh, explanation. So I think there's, uh, there are movements uh, right now to make uh, the, the learning processes uh, more transparent so that uh, experts can review that and decide if the uh, algorithm decided for something that was there for reason and then analyze the reasons and confirm, yes, it's a good path or not. That's right, Roberto. So you are pointing into another very important direction that, uh, um, I mean, it's uh, very hot and that explainability. I mean, that may hinder the adoption of AI in any field, uh, and in particular um, in medicine, as we discussed, but also other, uh, other fields. But we don't have uh, uh, time uh, to extend, um, but for sure we'll have seminars and talks about it. Um, I think uh, we, we'll close it here because we had a very long discussion. We kind of uh, went over a little bit time and some of the questions that I see on the, uh, on the screen have been mostly addressed and whatever wasn't addressed, we'll address them in the uh, document that we will share. Um, so before closing this event, um, I just wanted to say one thing is that, uh, again, I owe an apology uh, for the lack of gender diversity in the panel. Uh, I mean, uh, believe me, I, I organized other panels where I was very attentive to this. So I wanna make sure that everybody on the other side, especially on the student side, but also on the audience side, there are plenty, at least 50% as good uh, experts uh, in this field. And we are looking forward to have a very diverse uh, class uh, 2020, 2021 in this uh, master in artificial intelligence systems. And uh, without further ado, I would like to thank our uh, speakers, um, the department chair, the rector uh, for this event. And uh, uh, thank you again uh, for the students. That, again, they wanted to uh, attend and see a more comprehensive uh, um, uh, description of the masters. We'll We'll see you next week on Wednesday. For now, thank you, everybody. Have a stay safe, stay stay dry. Bye bye. Thank you very much.